Hello and welcome back to From the Workshop with me, your host, Brandon Hart. We are continuing our crash course series for GSMA about IoT device development. This will be part two in the series, and we are focusing on hardware considerations for your IoT device design. This is part two, so uh, there was a part one. If you haven't seen part one, you may wanna go back and watch that one um, because we are gonna build upon a lot of the information that we talked about in that one. In fact, just jumping straight in, when we left off in part one, we were talking about the differences between chipsets, modules, and end devices, or in our case, embedded modems. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit more about that, kind of do a refresher on the whole concept of these three devices here. Uh, so I decided to kick things up a notch, if you will. This is our supersized chipset. And so basically this is the low level device that sits inside of your IoT device and is the part that communicates uh, with the cellular network. So when you're sending data through an embedded modem, through a module, uh, ultimately everything is operating through this chipset. This chipset has to go through its own device certification, uh, its own uh, chipset certification rather, with carriers, with uh, regulatory bodies, etc. cetera. Um, you can design your end device with a chipset. However, the amount of RF engineering expertise that you're gonna have to have um, the amount of uh, uh, NRE, the amount of engineering that you have to put into it, the amount of development, the amount of testing and approvals and certifications and everything else, make it so that um, while paying much less for the hardware is great, the amount of uh, engineering time and, and money that you're gonna spend is gonna make it so that you really need to be doing devices in the millions of units before you're gonna see the ROI at this level. So what most uh, folks will do is they will use a module. Yes, this is our, this is our module. So a chipset again, has to go through testing and certifications and approvals. And then a module manufacturer will come along and they'll take that approved chipset and they will put that chipset in their module, add in other things like an applications processor, GNSS radios, software, etc., cetera, uh, to offer something that's a little bit more user friendly requires less RF expertise, requires less embedded expertise, still quite a bit, but not as much as developing at a chipset level. You pay a little bit more for the hardware, but you have less engineering, less overhead associated with uh, taking a device that is built on a module and bringing it to market. So here's an example of a module-based device right here. Um, so you could then basically take this module, put it in your device, and take your device through the final level of certifications. Um, so less testing overall, a little bit easier to do. But there is still that one final level. This is our, <laughs> this is our makeshift end device. So you take your module, you design it in to your end device. Now you have a full end device that contains a module, which then contains a chipset. Your full end device has uh, has to go through the full end device certifications, get all the testing, get all the approvals, etc. Um, of course, in the case of a NimbleLink Skywire modem, this is the end device, so it has uh, the module which has the chipset in it, so it's fully end device certified on its own. You then add it to your device design, and your whole device is already certified by virtue of the fact that you have that approved device. So hopefully that makes a little bit more sense, a little bit more visual aids, um, where you can design at a chipset level, but you're gonna have a lot of testing, a lot of RF ex expertise required, a um, lot of uh, additional heavy lifting, um, or you can design in a module. And if you design in a module, you're still gonna have a pretty good amount of RF expertise necessary, some engineering expertise. You're gonna have to do a lot of testing and certifications for your final device with that module in it. Or you can design you can design in the end device itself into your design, whether it's an embedded modem or uh, maybe just an off-the-shelf box, for example. That way you don't have to worry about certifications. The certifications are already done for you and you can simply make the greatest soil moisture monitoring system or tank monitoring system that you can and not have to worry about cellular device certifications. 
So again, I know that was a bit of a recap from the part one video, but we went a little bit deeper, focused on hardware a little bit more and why you might choose one over another. Um, but I wanted to, to make sure we did that recap. Um, from there, I also wanna talk about some of the security aspects of designing your device. Um, so the beautiful thing about designing LTE into your device design is that the communication between your radio and the network is already encrypted. There's already security built into that communications. Uh, so that's gonna help quite a bit. However, there are things you can do in the hardware to enhance the security of your device. You can have places on your hardware where you are storing encrypted keys. Um, and and um, you know maybe you've got uh, hardware elements that are actually um, uh, helping to enhance the security of your device itself. Um, but more than that, the way in which your device communicates over the network can uh, impact the security. So for example, um, you can have a device that has a whole bunch of security built into the hardware. Um, you're using an LTE connection, so you've already got that kind of encryption built in, that security inherent in the, in the software. But then when your device hits the internet, you've decided to use a public static IP address. Um, for the vast majority of all of you out there, I'm going to say, please don't do that. When you are setting your device up with a, pr a public static IP address, you're essentially putting a big target on your device and saying, hey, anybody who wants to come and attack my device. Uh, on the other hand, the carriers, the operators often offer you the capability to do things like private networks or have private IPs that either you designate to your devices or that the carriers will assign to your devices on your behalf so that the devices themselves are not reachable, not even visible from the public internet, but have the ability to reach the public internet or reach your own private networks. So there are some ways in which you can make your device communication a little bit more secure by virtue of the fact that you're using an LTE radio. Um, so just a couple things on security. It's, um, it's often overlooked, sadly, but with the number of IoT devices that are out there and the number of vectors of attack that they bring with them, security is essential to build in from the very, very beginning into your hardware um, and into your device design. <clears throat> Speaking of which, Let's say your devices are already deployed to the field and then you discover a security vulnerability. You discover something in your firmware or something about how you are operating that exposes your device to some security threats. How do you handle that? Do you roll a truck? Do you ask all of your customers to plug their devices in and update them with new firmware? I hope not. <laughs> um, the better way to do that kind of thing would be to build in support for things like firmware over the air. In a lot of cases, FOTA support, firmware over the air FOTA, um, is really not optional. And uh, uh, certainly we at Nimblelink will tell you that um, any device you design with a Skywire modem in it, FOTA support is not something that is optional. There are multiple types of FOTA. There's module FOTA, so again, each one of the modules themselves have firmware on them, and sometimes that firmware needs to be updated. Um, and then there's your own device firmware that's running on your microcontroller, your processor, running your software. Um, and both of those things may need updates from time to time. If you build in support for firmware over the air, you can simply push those new versions of firmware to the devices that are in the field, allowing new capabilities uh, better security enhancements, bug fixes, things like that to be performed, even though you may have hundreds of thousands of these units in the field, maybe all over the world, um, and, uh, and you can, from your own system, be able to push out those updates, make sure that everything is secure, make sure that everything is, is updated and future-proofed. From a hardware perspective, you can also build in capabilities to either have a standard footprint for a particular module family that you like from a, a module manufacturer so that future versions of your board can use similar footprints or similar uh, pinouts on the board itself. That way, say you design for CDMA, um, and uh, please don't do that, by the way. <laughs> uh, no, no, don't design anything for 2G or 3G. 
that's doing it wrong pretty much these days. Um, design for LTE uh, and, and then maybe 5G, when 5G reaches that massive machine type communication we talked about in the first part, uh, when that reaches maturity and you decide you wanna move to a 5G radio, you have the ability to put a 5G module back into that same footprint. Of course, I have to mention the idea of a removable radio, uh, such as a, a Nimblelink Skywire, where you simply design in the interface for the radio and then pick whatever radio technology you want at any point in your device's lifetime or in the deployment of multiple devices in the future. Um, so you have that capability as well. Um, and that prevents the need from additional certifications and additional testing and stuff like that when you deploy those new versions of radios. So that can be really, really nice for you also. Um, as we talk about making your hardware upgradable and flexible and modular in its design, we have to talk about these things. These are the antennas, obviously, you probably know that. Um, but of your entire device, these are the parts that actually affect how well your device can transmit and receive signals over those radio networks, the LTE 5G networks. Um, so these, radio, these antennas are critically important. Uh, it's mostly important that you look at the frequencies and the ground planes associated with the data sheets for each of the antennas you plan to use. Know the frequencies for the carriers and the parts of the world that you plan to deploy across um, because either you have antennas that you can swap out and deploy to different parts of the world or you have uh, you know, maybe an antenna such as this one that has a wide frequency response and can work across many, many different types of frequencies. Pay a little bit more for something like that, but it gives you the, the, the utmost flexibility in your radio design. Antennas really, really are important. Um, we've got a couple videos on antennas. Uh, we did some fun stuff uh, on antenna design as well, so we'll link that down below. Um, but I, I really just wanna make sure you're designing for your antenna from the time you're designing your PCB, from the beginning, because the ground plane makes a huge difference. Um, just uh, <laughs> if you look at the data sheet for the antenna, um, Note that the data sheets um, um, signal uh, capabilities for the particular antenna that you're that you're talking about is only relevant with the ground plane that it was tested at. Um, so don't think that you can just slap an antenna on anything and get the same response that the data sheet gives you. So, all right, I'll talk about uh, I'll stop talking about antennas now, but uh, just wanted to make sure that we touched on that. The last thing I'll talk about in terms of designing an IoT device for LTE networks is uh, probably the one thing that we see the most issues with with a lot of our device developers, and that is not designing in capacity for enough power. Uh, so as you design in the interface, again, module, Skywire modem, whatever it may be, you want to make sure that you're going to be able to accommodate the bursty nature of LTE, the bursty nature of cellular, um, because it can it can draw a lot of, of power in very, very short bursts. Um, we tell our device designers to design in two amp capabilities. And again, that's not sustained two amps, it's not continuous two amps, but it is a short burst of power that can be up to two amps in some cases. If you design it in for two amps, you're gonna be covered. Just make sure that you have a quick response on the power supply. Um, namely, don't use LDOs, use a switching power supply and you should be golden. Uh, design in capacitors, design in the capability to do that. Um, and, uh, and you'll be all set. In terms of testing, in terms of taking your prototype to production, we'll talk about that in part three. Uh, different ways to make sure that everything is going to work the way you want it to when you actually launch your product and start putting units in the field. Um, so that's just a, a teaser for the next part. We'll talk about that shortly. But until then, if you liked the video, please let us know. If you have comments on the video, let us know down below. Um, we do have other videos that get a little bit deeper in a lot of these topics. Um, we can't cover everything in detail in this particular one. Um, so, uh, so we'll have some links for you there as well. Uh, but please like, subscribe, leave comments, shoot us emails at workshop at nimblelink.com. 
and thanks to GSMA. And we'll see you in part three. And until then, have fun building.